I'm Leah. I just finished reading um, Antonia Darter's Language, Ideology, and Power. This was a mind-blowing read. Um, she describes how uh, nations use systematic racism to um, weed out minority languages to ensure subordination, racialized institutions have supported miseducation, mass incarceration, deportation, and genocide of racialized minorities. Darter explains um, linguistic genocide is killing off a people's language as opposed to just killing off the people. And now this is true in a lot of countries where there is a language of instruction, primarily English in a lot of countries, as opposed to the mother tongue. And this is causing a dynamic where children are encouraged to learn this new educational language in replacement of their mother tongue. Sometimes being discouraged from using their mother tongue in class and even discouraged from using their mother tongue at home because they wouldn't be practicing their educational language. As a matter of fact, California had an 18 year period where they were trying to weed out any Spanish language in education or any, any language other than English outside of their education systems. The difficulty is that if the number of people in an area speak a given language is very small, then it's difficult to support that language in a public education system. A great example of this comes from an article I read um, about the Cherokee Nation. The article that I read, The Preservation of Cherokee Language Rests with the Children by Martha Wagoner, talks about how for years uh, children were not even taught the Cherokee language from their parents for fear that their children wouldn't learn English as well. But even in the 1800s, when a lot of Cherokee students were forced to go to boarding schools, there was a lot of effort to eradicate any, any knowledge of the Cherokee language. Currently today, there are fewer than 300 native Cherokee speakers remaining in North Carolina. Uh, the clock is ticking to preserve the language and culture too. Um, there is a school that opened in Cherokee, North Carolina, which opened in 2004, and it has about 90 students. The school is called Kituwa. However, the school has had a lot of difficulty finding Cherokee, native Cherokee speaking teachers on account of, for generations, Cherokee has not really been taught. So a lot of the people who are still native in Cherokee are a lot older in their late 50s, 60s, 70s. And in addition to being scarce, a lot of these people are suffering from health problems. In Darter's article, she says the politics of language signals formidable struggles around the world where the inextricable relationship of language, ideology, and power is clearly unmistakable. Um, with this, I agree. I think there's honestly very little in Darter's article that I wouldn't agree with. It was brilliantly written. However, in the premise of accepting that globalization is inevitable, and that there are major advantages to an international education, it's going to be difficult to strike a balance between being a well-adapted to a globalized world and maintaining cultural minorities worldwide. I think that especially in countries like China or the U.S., where there are many different languages being spoken and many different ethnic cultures to be preserved, it's going to be it's going to continue to be a push and pull to gain any real government support for minority language education. One of the major players and the difficulty of starting a language school is the resources and the funding. I think that there could definitely be more government funding, perhaps scholarships and grants of some kind for um, minority language schools to help promote um, culture and promote language. One of the biggest deficits would be the shortage of multilingual professionals in the industry. In an article I read called Multilingual Paraprofessionals, a dual language learner is a child between the ages of zero and eight who's in the process of learning English in addition to their native language. Statistically, one in five students in America speaks a non-English language in their home. However, less than one in eight teachers can speak a second language. There is an obvious gap here in the generation of teachers and students to come. So what we really need is to boost more multilingual paraprofessionals and credential them up to teachers. How can we do this?
Well, many multilingual paraprofessionals have the language abilities. They just don't have necessarily the, the full licensure. Getting a license, a teacher's license in America, is a multi-step process. And it also requires being completely literate in English. So how do we get more multilingual teachers? So currently, there are lots of multilingual teacher's assistants who we call paraprofessionals. Unfortunately, only one in five multilingual paraprofessionals currently have a bachelor's degree. And those who've already obtained degrees in foreign countries have to go through a process of getting foreign credentials recognized in the United States. Currently, the low wages of paraprofessionals are one of the primary barriers to getting credentials for becoming an actual teacher. It costs money. You have to have a bachelor's degree. You have to pay for praxis testing, additional teacher's courses, student teaching, paying for background checks, paying for licensure, and all of these things add up. Local policymakers need to be taking these financial realities into consideration when designing programs to enhance the credentials for paraprofessionals. There could be more scholarship programs for people currently student teaching. Um, more programs like the Grow Your Own. Grow Your Own is a program that helps financially fund your route to becoming a teacher. And in exchange, you get debt forgiveness when you teach in a low-income school for five years. Policymakers can incentivize higher education institutions to create clear pathways with additional supports along the way for multilingual teacher candidates. In the end, it's going to be necessary to equip a country with more multilingual teacher candidates and incentivize becoming teachers for groups who can speak minority languages. It's also going to be crucial to help provide resources to communities struggling to maintain their cultural identity and their languages.